Good evening. My name is Mark Weistuck. I'm uh, the interim executive director of the Skirball Center. I would like to uh, welcome you to what is now the fifth annual Charles Grossman Lecture in Jewish Intellectual History. Before we begin with with a lecture, I would like to express our gratitude and thanks to Carol Grossman for establishing this lecture series in honor of her beloved husband, Charles Grossman. I had the privilege of working with Charlie for many years. Charlie was a devoted and committed officer and trustee of the Temple Emanuel Board. He was also for many years the chairman of the Temple's House Committee. It was during his tenure that the temple undertook a comprehensive restoration and refurbishment of the interior of our sanctuaries. This was a complex, long-term project which Charlie undertook and implemented not as a responsibility, but as a passion. He devoted endless hours to orchestrating all the myriad pieces that such a comprehensive restoration program entails. Watching him direct the many architects, engineers, and contractors, I came to realize that for Charlie, this wasn't just another building project. He saw this as a house of God that demanded a level of care and attention that could only be described as sacred. But this wasn't all Charlie did to express his zeal for Judaism. Charlie keenly recognized that as important as it was to preserve Emmanuel's home, it was equally essential to maintain, enhance, and strengthen the activities that take place in that home. For Charlie, after worship, the most important Jewish act was education. And in his life, that found expression in the furtherance of liberal, pluralistic Jewish education for adults. As a student, as a mentor, and as a supporter, he was steadfast in championing the advancement of the Skirball Center for Adult Jewish Learning, and proud of the fact that it was Emmanuel that created and nurtured this learning enterprise and has achieved an un, that has achieved an unparalleled reputation in the city and probably the, the country for smart, in-depth, expansive, and creative adult Jewish study. Carol Grossman has sustained Charlie's legacy to both Skirball and Emmanuel by establishing this annual lecture series which bears his name and which features a renowned scholar exploring some dimension of Jewish intellectual thought. Carol, I personally can't thank you enough for your generosity and thoughtfulness, which has enabled us to bring scholars like Neil Gilman, David Ellenson, Deborah Lipstadt, David Rudiman, and tonight, Lawrence Hoffman, and many others in future years. Carol, thank you. And I would now like to call on our senior rabbi, Rabbi Joshua Davidson, to introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you. Let me add my welcome to all of you to what I know will be a very special evening. Annually, this lecture is one of the true highlights of each Skirball Center and Emanuel program year. And as such, we should take this as another opportunity to thank Dr. Mark Weistuck for guiding the center so masterfully these last 10 months, even as he approaches his retirement as Temple Emanuel's administrative vice president. We owe you, Mark, a tremendous debt of gratitude. And of course, I too want to thank Carol for establishing this important lectureship in her beloved Charlie's memory. It speaks to her commitment to our community's ongoing exploration of the richness and depth of Jewish thought, 
Her generosity is a great gift to us and one for which I am deeply, deeply grateful. I also want to acknowledge and welcome their daughter, Ellie Grossman, and Charlie's cousin, Joan Bronk. Because tonight's talk is also part of our congregation's year-long exploration of the history and future of Reformed Judaism in America organized by our program committee, I certainly would acknowledge and thank that wonderful team, many of whom are here, led by their chair, Claudia Platel. The title of this year's Charles Grossman Lecture in Jewish Intellectual History is How We Pray is Who We Are. This is your life, American Jews. And to deliver it is my beloved friend and teacher, Rabbi Dr. Lawrence Hoffman, here with his wife, Gail. Ordained as a rabbi in 1969, Dr. Hoffman received his Ph.D. in 1973 and has taught since then at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York. From 1984 to 1987, he directed HUC's School of Sacred Music. In 2003, he was named the first Barbara and Stephen Friedman Professor of Liturgy, Worship, and Ritual. Today, he teaches classes in liturgy, ritual and spirituality, as well as theology and synagogue leadership. Since its inception in 2008, Larry has directed the Tisch Fellows Program, created by our own wonderful members, Bonnie and Danny, a co-curricular offering that engages students in issues of synagogue leadership and contemporary challenges for religion in America. In 1994, Larry co-founded Synagogue 2000, which became Synagogue 3000, a trans-denominational project to envision the ideal synagogue as moral and spiritual center for the 21st century. So for more than 40 years now, Dr. Hoffman has combined research, training, and passion for the spiritual renewal of North American Judaism. And the best part is that over the next 18 months, he is bringing all that wisdom to us as a consultant as Temple Emmanuel embarks on its own visioning process. Rabbi Hoffman has written or edited 40 books, including My People's Prayer Book, a 10-volume edition of the Siddur with Modern Commentaries, which was named a National Jewish Book Award winner for 2007. His Rethinking Synagogues, a new vocabulary for congregational life, and his art of public prayer are widely used by churches and synagogues as guides to organizational visioning and liturgical renewal. In 2011, he received a second National Jewish Book Award for co-authoring Sacred Strategies, Transforming Synagogues from Functional to Visionary. And he will be talking about the newest book in his Prayers of Awe series, all the World, Universalism, Particularism, and the High Holy Days, right here next fall. Larry's articles, both popular and scholarly, have appeared in eight languages on four continents, including his regular column in English in the Jewish Week. He is a past president of the North American Academy of Liturgy in January 2004, receiving that organization's annual Bracha Award for outstanding lifetime contributions to his field. Having him with us tonight is truly our bracha, our blessing. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rabbi Dr. Lawrence Hoffman. Good evening, everybody. I, uh, prefer to speak with a lavalier mic, which is what I'm wearing. This is actually not my voice. And uh, I tend to draw pictures in the air sometimes as I speak, so I hope you'll pardon me if I don't just stand be, be saw, behind the uh, podium. I, too, want to thank Al Grossman for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, it is a great pleasure always to come to Temple Emmanuel, which is a great synagogue, a great among greats. And so to be here is always an honor. Working with the synagogue, uh, particularly, I appreciate being here. I had occasion to say to one or two people uh, this evening 
that uh, being a student at the Hebrew Union College and then a faculty member has brought me here many, many times. And so I came to Emmanuel to work with Emmanuel with a great deal of regard and with a great deal of respect and honor for what this institution represents. Since then, since joining uh, you and working with you, um, I have added to that sense of deep respect, a sense of love, because I've gotten to know some of the people in the synagogue. And I want to say to you, therefore I come here with a deep regard for what you are and with a deep sense of fondness for the people who constitute who you are. And so I really am just thrilled to be here tonight, and I thank you very much for making this possible. Um, I, uh, I'm a liturgist. Uh, that is a word that I don't generally speak in polite company so easily. It's not a word that flows easily off of Jewish tongues, though it does flow off Christian tongues quite a bit. Uh, liturgy is far more central, it would seem, to Christianity than to Judaism. We talk of ourselves as a people who studies more than we talk of ourselves as a people with a liturgy. But nonetheless, I am a liturgist, and once I've already been invited to the podium and I stand in front of you, I am prepared to admit it since you are now a captured audience and you probably won't leave. It's actually a very exciting topic because of the fact it deals with prayer books. And prayer books may be the book that you take for granted since it's just handed to you and you just assume, therefore, since it's for free, how important could it be? But actually, it's the most important book, in my opinion, for Jewish, Jewish history. Yes, we have the Bible. Yes, we have the Talmud. Yes, we are the people of the book. We have a library that covers walls and walls and walls. But do not imagine that for the vast course of Jewish history, Jews read all that stuff. I mean, we're not the first generation not to have read it all. We tend to think that, oh, but for the multitude of our sins, we now would be as learned as all the people of the past. But in fact, even those people of the past who were not bothered with such things as having to go to college and public school, even those people of the past rarely had the knowledge, the capacity, the time, or the money to buy the books and read them and spend time with them. And so they had bits and pieces of them, with one exception, the prayer book. The prayer book's one book they carried with them. The prayer book was the soul of the Jew. They didn't know everything about Judaism, but they knew what the prayer book said, as if all of Judaism was being funneled down to them in a, in a funnel that kind of distilled the essence of the thing, and it was the essence that came out. And so, in fact, the prayer book really is the soul of the Jew. And to appreciate the prayer book and prayer books as they develop through time is to appreciate the soul of the Jew in its various guises through time. And that's what I want to explore with you tonight. I want to explore particularly the Union Prayer Book, which is the book that you have used so, so regularly and so lovingly through these years, and help you see how that really is, in fact, much of the story of Jewish life. But before actually turning to that, I want you to think a little more about what prayer is and what a prayer book is, because even though I've called it a prayer book, the truth is, it only looks like a book. It's not really a book. Here's what I mean. They were doing prayer long before they had a prayer book, after all. It looks like a book because printers print it and there are two covers on it. But think about this for a moment. Imagine if we were to array, this is one of my diagrams see in the air, imagine if we were to array all of literature, what we would find would be over here the novel. Now the novel is the most private and personal sort of thing you read. It came into being all on its own, mostly in the 19th century, when people who were of the Enlightenment across Europe in particular, they were discovering that they had a self. Having a self, not necessarily having your identity formed by everybody else and by your culture, but being able to decide what your life would be, led people to want this kind of book that would tell stories of other people, and they could identify with them and decide what their life would be like. But that meant a private search, a search for the self. And so novels are the sort of thing that you buy in a bookstore. Uh, for those of you who still go to bookstores, uh, buy in a bookstore, you look at the shelf, you peruse what's there, and you don't expect anyone to say to you, what are you reading? Even when you go home and you put your feet up and read the book, you tend to say, I'll go read my book, and you don't expect people to say, well, I don't think you should read that. That's not good literature. My fifth grade teacher said that, but I don't expect that to happen as an adult. That's my business. What I read is my business, the novel. I take it on vacation private. You move on the spectrum a little bit, you get to poetry. Poetry is not so private. 
That is, poetry is meant to be read out loud. If I came across you in the library upstairs and I saw you walking back and forth reciting poetry, I would say, oh, I understand. You want to hear it. You know the poet intended it to be read aloud. That's more public. I know you can buy poetry and read it at home. I do sometimes. But poetry is meant to be public and meant to be out loud, even though you can buy it on your own. And a little farther over, you get to drama. Drama, too, looks like a book, because you can buy Shakespeare, say, but the whole point is not to read it. The point is to go to it, see it performed. If I tell you that I'm an expert at American theater, and you say to me, guess what? They've got, just across there in Broadway, they've got a renewal of some of the greats in American theater. Why? You won't believe this, but Arthur Miller is playing again. You don't expect me to say, now nah, I've seen it. Or worse, I read them. The whole point is to go. And every time it's replayed, it's new, it's different, it's redefined by the actors and the director. That's entirely public, even though you could read it in advance and read it afterward. But the point is to see it. And lastly, you see, we come to prayer. I want to describe prayer as a kind of theater because it's public, altogether public. I know you can pray on your own, but we're talking here about the prayer book and public prayer. Like theater, it's something you have to go to. Nobody says, I've got a night off, I think I'll go to Barnes & Noble and buy a prayer book to read. <laughs> the prayer book is what you get to pray, and that's the whole point, the worship. And so, it's really the worship that matters. And here's the difference between prayer, which is a sacred drama that engages us all, in which we come dressed differently, in which we read lines that become our own that someone else wrote years before, and now we read them, we ourselves are the actors in the play, and in which we sing and hear great music and walk out the way you might walk out of a drama. But there is this difference. Imagine you are Lady Macbeth, and you finish your great performance, and you take off your makeup, and you dress in your jeans, and you go home. On the way home, you're not allowed to murder someone and say, well, what do you expect? That's who I am. But just the opposite is true of going to pray. The whole point of prayer is to make the lines your own to the point where you go home and you act out the play in your own lives. If you go home from Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur services and you cheat somebody, you somehow miss the point. If you go home from Shabbat and you say, God, I've got to get my work done, you know, I mean, come on, you missed the point. There's something about prayer then that moves us to greatness, that raises us up to eternity. It is then the drama of the Jewish people through time. The Jewish people search for God and for community and for all that matters. And to go to prayer is to be engaged in that long story of the Jewish search through time and to make it our own through the sacred drama of the lines that someone else wrote long ago that become our own at that moment. And so I'm here to talk about this act of prayer, the act of prayer as sacred drama that becomes our lives because we take on those lines and that prayer service and they make them part of our own biography. The particular story I have to tell is, of course, the Union Prayer Book, and primarily, I may go a little farther than the beginning, but you'll see what I mean. We'll see how far we get. Our story begins in 1846, actually, with Isaac Mayer Wise, who came to these shores. Uh, I landed in New York, walked up and down New York, and saw nothing but poverty and ignorance. We don't tend to think of German Jews who came here as poor and ignorant, but in fact, they were at the beginning. The ones who weren't stayed in Germany as long as they could. And so he looked up and down the streets in 1846 and he kept a diary and wrote in the diary, there is only ignorance here. And yet what made the man great, great enough that he became the father of our movement and in fact of all of liberal progressive Judaism in this country and in Canada, what made him great is he believed in the future. And he wrote this magnificent line in his diary, Yes, he said, it's poor and the people know nothing, but 
He predicted there's life in this Jewry. And he said, this is a sui generis Jewish community. Someday it will flourish and become the greatest Jewish community in the world, something never before seen in all of history. And then he wrote this great line. He said, I painted the future in golden hues. He did leave New York shortly thereafter, was called to a congregation in Albany, New York. I'll tell you this story very briefly. He got into a fight with his president in Albany. He tried to take an Orthodox congregation and make it into reform. Tried to do it a little too fast. The uh, president didn't agree. These things happen sometimes in congregations. Uh, so they got into a little fight. And unfortunately, it was a real fight. They swung at each other. It was actually a fist fight. And unfortunately, it happened on the pulpit, which was very unfortunate. <laughs> it was on Rosh Hashanah, too, so you know, it was crowded. And shortly thereafter, actually, he left and found his way to another congregation. Eventually, at any rate, he was called to a congregation in Cincinnati where he founded not just uh, the synagogue, but also founded the Hebrew Union College, the Union for Reformed Judaism, which is the organization for all reformed congregations, and of course, the college, which forms uh, rabbis for the movement. And then, since he figured rabbis had that some place to go to, he founded the Central Conference of American Rabbis so they could belong to something, too. And he was president of them all. Sometimes when I'm busy, I think of this man and I say, I'm not really busy, because at the same time, he was a senior rabbi, don't forget. And by the way, he edited a great Jewish newspaper, perhaps the greatest of the time. So that's what he did alongside traveling back and forth and founding congregations all over the country. This was really, really a great man. Now, I told you this story about Albany, not just uh, because it's a funny story, but because he learned something in Albany that comes in handy now. He decided he wanted to form a movement. He wanted, he wanted modern Judaism to thrive in this country. And he knew the lecture that I'm about to give, more or less, he knew that the prayer book was the secret. He knew that if he could get a modern service that would inspire people to greatness, that then they would become great. That is, he knew that if they could only be part of that service, that worship, the lines to become their own, they would walk out changed. And if they had only an old-time service, then they would be old-time Jews. So he wanted a new service that meant a new prayer book, and he set to work writing one. And what he had learned in Albany was he couldn't have his way unless he got other people to agree with him first. So he learned the beginning of politics, and he therefore summoned to Cleveland, an otherwise unknown conference, believe me, uh, to Cleveland he summoned all of the rabbis who are reasonably liberal, there were so few of them, I'm sure they fit into a single room, a bedroom. And he asked them if he could have their permission to write a prayer book, would they support him? Now, some of them were liberal to the nth degree, and others were only at A, B, or C. And so they didn't all agree, and some of them distrusted him for what he was going to do, because they knew that he was, after all, quite liberal compared to orthodoxy. And so he had to give in order to get. He had learned that in Albany, too. In order to get, the permission to write it, he agreed apparently that he would preach the doctrine of Jews, even liberal Jews, being responsible for all the laws of the Talmud. Why he agreed, we can argue. He probably figured nobody would know. But of course, word got out. And among the people who read and heard of it was another great rabbi, a man by the name of Einhorn. Rabbi Einhorn had come from Germany as well, of course. He'd landed eventually in Baltimore, Maryland. He was known by his biographers as a man of stormy temperament. I'd let you figure out what you think that means. Something about he couldn't hold a job, maybe. At any rate, he was a man who spoke his mind. Came here because in Germany he really did have trouble holding a job because he would not keep quiet. He was a man of stormy temperament, after all. He knew it was right and he wanted to say it. Found himself in Baltimore during the Civil War, opposed to slavery, even though all around him people had slaves, to the point where he had to flee for his life because he insisted on opposing slavery when it was not the popular or the healthy thing to do. For a man like that, to say his piece on a prayer book was nothing. 
When he heard Isaac Mayer Wise had promised that we would all keep halacha, he couldn't believe it. He did what any other self-respecting rabbi would do. He wrote a long letter to the editor denouncing Wise in the Jewish press. It was a very long letter because he wrote it in German. First sentence was a paragraph. When he was done, he warned his readers, beware, he said, of Rabbi Wise. When he says he'll build you a prayer book, beware of the prayer book. And then he said, if you follow him and his prayer book, you will be shackled. Your freedom will be taken from you. And with that, he sat down at his desk to write a better prayer book. Because he knew, too, that the prayer book determines how we pray, and how we pray is who we are. The title of the prayer books was on the moderate rabbi in Cincinnati, the man who had learned patience, slow approach to change, and the radical in Baltimore who wanted to change everything immediately. And I guess the question is, who would publish first? I'll let you think about that for a moment. And meanwhile, I'll step back, I'll tell you more about why a prayer book matters. How is it that a prayer book determines our identity? It's not as simple as you think. It's really not that you read the book and you learn it and you say, okay, that's what I believe. Not at all. There are actually three ways that a prayer book gives a message. The first one really is the manifest content of the book. If you read the book, at least in the vernacular, like the Union Prayer Book, then you actually know what it says. If you read it in Hebrew, you may not. But for modern prayer books, which are largely in the vernacular, there is a message. The only problem with that is you don't always intuit the message so well, because truth be told, you don't always pay too much attention to what you're reading. Now, there are exceptions. I remember a woman who I met some 30 years ago she told me that she had beautifully and joyously lit Shabbat candles in her home for almost 60 or 70 years, I forget now, not missing a single Friday night. Well, I was in awe, and I said to her, probably I'm in awe. And I said, tell me why, not that I think it shouldn't be, but why is this so important to you? I mean, what does lighting candles mean to you? Without missing a beat, she said to me, Light is a symbol of the divine. Where'd you get that line? You know, page seven, Union Prayer Book. She'd been reading the book so long, she thought it was her idea. I mean, that's what I mean by getting your lines from the prayer book. Left her own devices, she never would have sat there one Friday night and saying, I think light is a symbol of the divine. I mean, it doesn't happen that way. The prayer book gives us lines to say that match what we're feeling internally and provide us then with a way to express what is nearest and dearest to us. And she had found that line and carried it with her. That, of course, is a line that she really had intuited and memorized. But as I say, much of the prayer book you don't really pay attention to. Haven't you ever found yourself, let's be honest now, haven't you ever found yourself kind of daydreaming at services? I mean, for, actually, it's not a bad thing to do. I recommend it. In other words, it's the last bastion of a quiet place where you can get in touch with what you're thinking. Sit back, think of the great questions of life or the issues that are bothering you deeply or what's happening in your life, and, or just simply think nothing, but feel the quiet. Just take flow over you. And so it's very common that people will say to me, I don't remember that service all that well. Haven't you ever been in a service and you say to the person next to you, you say, did we pass the Shabbat already? I don't remember it. Did we get, how did we get this far? I mean, that does happen. So if I gave you a test on any given Shabbat as to what you had read, the odds are you would fail it. Because the manifest content of the prayer book takes over only after long periods of reading. We don't read it as if we're studying it. You don't come to services with a pen and pencil to underline and make notes in the margin. So the manifest content is important, but only over a longer period of time. There are two other ways that the prayer book gives us a message of identity. 
The second way, the first is manifest content. The second way, then, the first of the other two, that is, is what I will call prayer book structure or design. Now, in fact, artists will know well that the design of a prayer book is important. It has to be something that's beautiful. It has to bespeak its purpose. If I give you a shabby old prayer book or something in a loose leaf binder that's half ripped out, it doesn't have the same impact upon you. So the design of a prayer book matters, and different prayer books over time have been designed differently. I will give you an example, actually, from my early years as a rabbinic student. I was friends with a classmate who lived in the Bronx, and I went home with him for a Seder. Because we were rabbinic students, we decided we really should go to synagogue that evening before the Seder. That was a thought that it never would have occurred to us before that, I'll be honest. But we decided to go, but we didn't go far away. There had to be one in the neighborhood. We had to get to the Seder, after all. And we found then a little storefront synagogue. Have you ever gone into a synagogue, and the minute you walked in, you knew it was a mistake? <laughs> there in that synagogue were maybe a dozen or so elderly gentlemen. <laughs> I thought they were elderly. Now they look like me, I suppose. But they were elderly gentlemen, I thought. Some people are born old, you know. And they were davening up a storm with a prayer book that was strange to me. I did not come to Hebrew Union College knowledgeable in Judaism. It's not as if I could pick up a prayer book and understand it fluently. I learned that as a student. So I was somewhat lost. All along the wall were not such windows as you have here, but pictures of the zodiac that had been painted on the walls rather crudely. I thought at first I was really not in a Jewish place. I wasn't used to that. It turned out it was a Kabbalistic synagogue. So now I make out of that experience a, a sort of thought experiment. Imagine you're with me. Imagine you like I know nothing, but imagine you know really nothing. You walk in and you pick up the book and you discover it's all in Hebrew, but you know nothing. You don't even know which end is up. So what do you do? If you're following this thought experiment, the odds are you take your place. Uh, there were no women there, so 50% of you will have to imagine that you are different enough that you could at least attend. But I now walk in, I stand next to the man, and you would have too, and you sort of do what he does. You don't want to look strange, after all. So he goes, ay, ay, you go, ay, 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 he goes, you go, he bows, you bow, and so on. Now, um, out of this experiment, what the prayer book looks like, I want to tell you that I want to illustrate what I call the 1 to 10 theory. Prayer book structure is such that it gives you a picture of your identity such that you can intuit what it is no matter how much you know about Judaism. We are all at 1, knowing nothing, to 10, being practically geniuses in the subject. And no matter where you are, you may not get all the details, but you will get a, some idea of the message just from looking at the book, because anybody can look at it like a great work of art. You, if you understand art, you understand it all. But if you understand nothing, you can at least appreciate the art, similarly with the look of a book. So here I am now, knowing nothing, with the book in hand. And now imagine I say to the gentleman next to me, excuse me, I can't help but ask you. I, I don't know much about the book, but I notice some of the letters are bigger than others, as was the case. Can you explain that for me, please? He looks at me and he says to me in this experiment, he says to me, well, I could tell you were a one when you walked in. So yes, I know you'll need to know more. I'll be happy to share with you what I know, but I'm only a three. I don't know a lot either. The rabbi, he's a 10. He knows it all. But what I do know is the words that are written large are all God's name. God's name is really important. As to why, you've got to ask someone higher up on the spectrum. Now, eventually, I did find out that the reason God's name was written large was not just respect, but it had to do with a deep Kabbalistic doctrine that would take me much longer to explain than I can tonight. But note how just because of how the book looked, I, a one, walking in knowing nothing, could get a message of, oh, I see something about what this was all about. And someone at 10 would have seen all of the secrets of God and the mysteries of mysticism right there in that one fact of structure. Similarly, whether a prayer book opens left to right or right to left matters. The Union Prayer Book is called Union Prayer Book. 
i.e. it's English, it's not Hebrew. There is a Hebrew title. Nobody even knows it. It's never used. Whether a prayer book then is big or small, has pictures in it, these are all matters of, of design. And all of that gives you a message of who we are, just by the feel of the thing that you hold in your hand, which matters deeply. Manifest content, structure or design, and finally, the most important part of the prayer book service. I said before, a prayer book isn't really a prayer book. So much I intimated as it is a script, a script for the sacred act of worship. Prayer books then are scripts that allow a certain story to, put, to play out. They allow a certain kind of play, but not another kind. So think of prayer books, then, as allowing a kind of worship to take place. And since worship is a, is a drama, as I said before, you have to think of, then, as worship as having a sort of choreography. So what matters most about the act of prayer, of the three things I've mentioned, content, structure, or design, and the third one being the most important, choreography, it is choreography that matters most. Again, let me illustrate choreography a little bit from my own uh, past um, and bring it up to date with something you'll know. Uh, I was born in a small community in Canada. Uh, my father, uh, it was customary then, as I know you understand, my father bought a pew. He owned it, and he didn't come very often, but he came on the high holidays, so we always sat in exactly the same place. It was, however, an orthodox shul completely. My parents were never orthodox, but the rabbi was, and the service was entirely from an orthodox siddur, entirely in Hebrew. So on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I didn't spend a lot of time there. I was pretty bored. I couldn't wait to leave and get a break. Uh, but I did spend enough time to remember the man who owned the pew next to my father. His name was Mr. Mossberg, a more lovely man you could not meet. But there was something odd about him. Namely, he tended to yell his prayers. I mean, yell. You yell, you know. And I said to my father, why is Mr. Mossberg yelling? And he'd say, I can't hear you. Mossberg's yelling. Years later, I figured it out. Mr. Mossberg was not an angry man, and for all I know, he never yelled. But he came from a shuttle in Eastern Europe, where every family had seven kids and one room. He couldn't get his parents' attention by saying, excuse me. I don't think there was a Yiddish word for quiet. He yelled. He figured, if you want attention, you got to get it by yelling. And so he yelled, made noise. So he figured if God's going to listen to his prayers, he should yell them. God's got all these people to listen to. It became commonplace for him, therefore, to yell. And everybody kind of accepted it as okay. I was telling a story, incidentally, uh, uh, some years back. And a um, man walked up afterwards and said, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Lionel Mossberg. I'm Mr. Mossberg's son. <laughs> and he said, so that's why my dad yelled. Now I get it. I want to thank you. Now, that's part of the choreography. It's not built in. It doesn't say in the prayer book, congregation here yells. I mean, I don't mean that. But it meant that was allowed. It was permitted. It was part and parcel of what made the noise in the place. Think of music not just as what is actually musical, but as the noise, what goes on in services. And so it was the aural nature of what happened. And there was a lot of yelling. There was also a lot of davening. I don't mean to make fun of it. Please understand, I do not mean that. Um, I only mean to draw attention to what it was like in a traditional place. The kind of place, by the way, that Emmanuel and other Reformed congregations fought against because we didn't want to think of ourselves as that kind of Jew. But in a traditional small shul, a small one, mostly they didn't yell, but they daven. If you've been raised in a place where people davened or visited it, this is the noise of davening. Noise, noise, noise underneath. Is that right? I submit to you that's not a happy sound. And that's because Jews in the shuttle were not happy. 
Forget these Hasidim dancing and singing. Shetel life was miserable. People who could get out did. But how we pray is who we are. The noise, the sound, the music bespeaks our heart. And the heart of the Jew in Eastern Europe, Shtetl was not happy. It was, oh, yeah, 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 they're killing us. I don't have any food today. I don't know. Oh, yeah, 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 God help me, please. Out of Eastern Europe, though, there were also great chazanim, great cantors. But think of what they sang. A great cantor of the 1920s, say, was a man named Yusselo Rosenblatt. He came here, he filled up concert halls with singing liturgical music, and Jews from Eastern Europe would come here flooded to see him. And what did he sing? I don't have the voice, I can't do it, but you imagine for a moment. He sang things that had come right out of the service. For Jews, by the way, who were socialists from Eastern Europe and didn't go to services, but they liked the sound of the prayers. And he would sing something like this. And the important thing was the menu. And when he reached that high note, people cried. And what did the song mean? God should rebuild the temple speedily in our days. The message, the message of a people who had been beaten down. And even here in America, that generation still hadn't made it. And the idea of remembering the old days and the profound nostalgia of it all came through in this great voice. And people cried their way in and out, thinking about, yeah, maybe God will rebuild the temple. Notice how the content of the prayer, God should rebuild the temple, which came from the high holiday service, mind you. Imagine hearing it as the high holiday service and thinking about your life and crying your way through the prayers, praying for a better time. That was the sound of the prayer from Eastern Europe. And it's not just the music that's the choreography, it's where people sit, it's all of that. By contrast, those who came from Western Europe had a different sound. Think of the Shema Yisrael, Shema Yisrael, you know the one that we sing? That was traditional, but it had been set to music by a great cantor from Vienna in a great modern reform congregation. They didn't want anything to do with, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. God, shouldn't we build a temple? We don't want to go there. What they wanted to do then was see themselves as modern men and women. They sat together. They were Europeans intent on a great Jewish future. They wanted the sound of prayer to bespeak a great future. And so, indeed, that's what they got. Vienna was the home of the waltz. And so the cantor who set this old tune to modern music so anybody could sing it, set it to a waltz form. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad da 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 Baruch Shemir. Because the waltz was the sign of the future. And think of what it meant. It meant that these Jews who were modern thought that they would waltz their way into the future. They would change history. They weren't part of that Eastern European ethos waiting for God to rebuild the temple. They were going to make it on their own. Now it was that message of that choreography that came here to Emmanuel. And so we returned to the Union Prayer Book. Remember the two guys writing it? Who would publish first? The moderate Isaac Mayer Wise in Cincinnati or the radical David Einhorn in Baltimore. And the answer is they both published first. <laughs> it could happen then because there weren't any great big publishing houses and you publish it with someone local and your mother bought 10 copies and she gave some to the neighbors and eventually some people started using them. Both prayer books then managed to get out and were used. But eventually in the 1890s it came to a vote. And so finally the rabbis met to decide what would be the face of Judaism. Reform Judaism. Would they have a moderate book like Isaac Mayer Wise's or a radical one? The moderate book was a book that had a lot of Hebrew. Hebrew on one side, English on the other, and by the way, German in the middle for people who just got off the boat. And yet, that was Isaac's book, 
And yet, it had the same message of nobility. And yet, the more radical one was a book that was written all in German, actually, because the rabbi believed you could never get culture in America. He had come from Germany with Bach and Beethoven. And what did you have in America? Cowboys and Indians. So he wrote the whole thing in German, got rid of almost all the Hebrew, insisted then on something in the vernacular. That was a radical book. Both of them gave the same message, but this one is not radical in its style, in its form, the way it looked, its structure would tell you you are kind of more radical Jew. You would have thought they would have chosen Isaac Mayer Wise's book. He was the president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis who took the vote. Einhorn was dead by then. He wasn't even there. And guess what? They chose the radical book by Einhorn. And that was largely because Eastern European Jews were starting to flood these shores. And they wanted a book that was radical enough that it would block any possibility that they were too closely related to the Eastern European Jews who were coming here in such large numbers. They wanted to be so sure of their identity. They wanted a service that Eastern European Jews wouldn't be caught dead in, as it were. And that's what they got. It became a radical reform service. The Union Prayer Book then, the first edition, that came out in 1895, had almost all English. The rabbi was called minister. The, there was almost nothing for the congregation to read because they were afraid the people would daven it. So all they had were responsive readings where the congregation got only one line. How far ahead of, the con of everybody else can you get with one line? Mostly the reader, the rabbi, who had been taught to read in deep voices at seminary, got great big long passages that he could read slowly and distinctly. Uh, the people didn't sing anything for fear they would yell. And everything went to the choir. And so it became a very staid kind of service. The message of the service, though, was brilliant. The message of that service was spectacular. They would have gotten it from wise, too, because the message was a message of a Judaism for a modern world. In the face of all that anti-Semitism of the centuries, the message of this service is, we Jews belong here and we're staying. Not only that, they believed they would waltz through history, not just changing history, but doing it with non-Jews. The great message was a message of a Jewish mission for the world. We would change the world, and we would carry the world with us, and we would find allies among churches who wanted to do it with us. This was altogether new. Jews had never imagined anything like that. This was a sense of human beings taking our stand together to change the world for the better. It was a pride in our past. It was a scholarly sense of what could be changed. It was a modern approach to Judaism with a scientific background. All of that was inherent in the service. And Jews walked home after service with this great pride in being Jewish and this great sense of the nobility of the whole enterprise. That was what the Union Prayer Book provided. And what, for that matter, it still provides. had at the time. We could look what happened after all of that. Even the Union Prayer Book was felt to have been worn out at times, and it went through two changes. It was revised in the 1920s, revised again in the 1940s. By the 1960s, Six-Day War especially broke out, which reminded Jews of Israel and tradition. And the result was our movement, at least, decided to change prayer books, so not every congregation accepted that change, as you well know. And now the movement has another prayer book, too. And by the way, what about conservative Jews? Those same Jews, largely from Temple Emmanuel, those same Jews who wanted desperately and properly, in my opinion, to have a service of nobility that would bespeak the modern enterprise those same Jews decided they would take care of Jews from Eastern Europe by buying up a little seminary in the Upper West Side that was called Jewish Theological Seminary of America and no one had ever heard of yet. They bought it up and they made it into a seminary for Eastern European Jews so that they could become modernized in their own way and they became the conservative movement. 
Only in the 1940s did they kick out the reform board, and then a conservative board took over, and they came up with their own prayer book. And if I were giving a lecture at Park Avenue Synagogue or something, it would now be about how they got a conservative Jewish identity through their prayer book. The biggest question that faces any Jewish community at any time is, who are we? What do we stand for? What is our identity? What's our, what's our connection to tradition? What do we want to pass on to the next generation? How do we want to walk out of the sanctuary? Feeling what? And what do people out there think about Judaism? What's their identity? How can we provide a message that speaks to them and at the same time influences them? What do we want to be? That's a huge question. And you know what? No one gives it too much thought. It's too big, maybe. But great congregations do. Great congregations think of who are we? Who do we want to be? What are the changes out there that we have to change to? What are other people thinking that matters to us? And what's our message for tomorrow? What do we want to take from our past into our present? And how do we present ourselves? Not only to others, but to ourselves. When you stand in a mirror, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? At the very center of it is this thing I call moral space. What do we believe deepest in our hearts? Who are the people we identify with most? When we say we're Jewish, what does that mean? And you know what? All that comes through prayer. How we pray is who we are. And this great congregation, recognizing the nobility of the past and the service that has bespoken so well who we are, must now reanalyze that and decide what are the past to bring forward and what message we want to provide even though we may change prayer one way or another. And how the changes should not just be to pander to people, but to bespeak our deepest aspirations of who we are, to provide a message for our children, our children's children, the next generation, and ourselves as well. It's not something that happens overnight. It requires deep, deep discussion. I'm proud to say this congregation has taken up that task. It will in many and sundry ways, as you've already heard, be engaged in a discussion of what will be Temple Emmanuel's message of tomorrow to the people in Temple Emmanuel and through this great city of New York and beyond. And part of that question will be what kind of prayer service will best speak to the world and speak to our hearts. And that decision has yet to be made. We're still engaged, barely beginning it. But it's an important discussion. It's a beautifully significant one. And it's one that every great community faces sooner or later, or it will no longer be great. I welcome you then, not just today, but to tomorrow, as the years that follow. I began by saying that I came to Temple Emmanuel with this great sense of honor to be here and respect for what it stands for. I said to you that I had now added to that a certain love that I've developed for the people I've met. And I will now add to this high regard and promise and love, I'll add the word promise. I have the sense not only of respecting what you are, that I did long ago, Falling in love with the many people I've met and now discovering the passion that you have, I am learning that now. But I have this great sense of promise. This is a great congregation. There's no one cut like it. And you know what? The best is yet to come. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, we've got time for a few questions, if anyone... Sure. Fred, why don't you stand up and speak loudly so everybody can hear it. And if I hear, I'll try to, uh, re sure. to repeat the question. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I completely agree with you in the way in which prayer books serve as a form of public rhetoric and in liturgy, oratory functions to make us who we are. But of course, I actually think that there's also the private dimension insofar as we do engage deeply with the words of the prayer book on our own. 
not only over time as the cognitive scientists have shown us, but as we may choose to reflect on the books themselves, since we know the Union Prayer Book has been used for private devotion for over a hundred years. Now, the one thing that I would say to you that hearing your talk really emphasizes to me, given this level of engagement, the most important thing of our prayer book is the need for it to be in a language that we can understand, a beautiful vernacular that we can most truly engage with, not just at the level of the heart, but at the level of the mind. And to just make another point further as far as this question of engagement, just as we saw over the course of the past century, who learned, who studied that prayer book? The Eastern European Jews, those first generations who in the early part of the 20th century, 20th century were the young men going to HUC, not German Jews, and who also continued to read the Union Prayer Book, people who weren't even Jewish and learned from it. So just as we today continue to read Jane Austen, George Eliot, Thackeray, Trollope, all of those greats of the 19th century, who for that matter shaped our English counterpart, mm -hmm. Lily Montague, yeah. whose yeah. theology was completely shaped by Victorian uh, poetry and novel, we too can revisit the Union Prayer Book for the beautiful theology it continues to teach us and that we can continue to engage with today in moving forward to our future yeah. because it is, is a yeah. beautiful source for universalist theology. Mm. I can't add to that. It was a wonderful <laughs> statement. Uh, it was a beautiful statement and a great tribute to the Union Prayer Book and I agree with what you said about prayer being private as well. Uh, you used one word particularly uh, two or three times which I'll pick up and that was the word to engage. So the real question of any prayer book is, does the prayer book engage, and how can it engage? And uh, when you say that we engage in it, we engage in it privately, we can engage in it publicly, and the large question is, how do we engage worshipers, really? So, um, but I certainly agree with what you had to say. Well, what I want to see in the next 18 months is for us to finally study the Union Prayer Book together, for us to look at its theology and have workshops and seminars mm -hmm. that we can voluntarily lead and participate in, where we can talk about what that theology is for us as liberal progressive Jews Thank you. in the classical reform tradition. Thank you for your suggestion. I have a sense the rabbi heard it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Right. Page 32, back to 24, back to 121. There's an order of service which starts at the beginning, and there's nothing superfluous to that service, and goes all the way to the end. Um, but that is not something that is done in synagogues, as far mm -hmm. as I can tell. Can you talk about, because I know you do a lot of interfaith work. I do. The, the order of service that has everything versus the full volume in which you're really only using a couple of dozen pages for any of the service. Well, uh, it turns out that um, worship books or prayer books, worship books is what they tend to call it in the Christian world, that worship books depend upon the tradition that they serve. So Episcopalian is different, say, than Lutheran and very different, say, than Methodist. And certainly different than Baptists who tend not to have any book at all. So Christians divide their worship into what they call liturgical faiths, people who have a book, and non-liturgical faiths where you can do pretty much whatever you like and uh, you just kind of sing together and someone reads something and the next thing you know someone's talking and whatever happens, happens, but there's no book at all. Think of them both as scripts. I told you that a prayer book is a script. Think of scripts being relatively open or relatively closed. Liturgical faiths like our own have a relatively closed script. We start and then we just keep on going. The other, uh, other, uh, other faiths like Mennonites have a relatively open script. The most open script at all would be the friends, where people just sit quietly and they say whatever comes to mind. It's a completely open script, even though it follows certain rules. Now, within closed script communities, like the Episcopalian, for example, and Jewish and Lutheran, uh, the layout of the book, whether you have to skip back and forth or whether you've just got it straightforward, is more a matter of uh, design than anything else. That, plus it's a matter of how long the service is. So if you have a relatively long service, certainly, or if you want to have a short book and you want to repeat the prayers regularly, then you need to skip back and forth because you need to have the Elenu at the end. You don't want to put the Elenu at the end of every service. And you therefore need to be able to move back and forth. If you have a Torah reading, but only on certain days, 
And if you have Torah liturgy, then you have to have it separate or else you've got to put it in all the services and you end up a too thick a book. So our moving back and forth is largely the fact that we have a closed script, but we, we don't want to have too large a book. And so we rather tell people where to move. Some uh, traditions have the kind of a shorter service. And when they read scripture, they don't have a whole lot of prayers. So, for example, the Episcopalians, they can simply say scripture or hear the Torah, here the Torah is read. I guess they don't say that. Here the Bible is read or the reading of Holy Scripture. And then they can have that in each service. It's just simply a, uh, an instruction. But I've sat now on several liturgy committees for our movement, and I can say that we agonize over that all the time. And we never get a solution to it that everybody likes, and that's just the way it is. Yep. Let's take, let's take um, two more. We'll try, to, we'll try to make them concise. Yeah, yeah right. and you know what? I'll take them both together, and then I'll see if they have anything to do with okay. each other. And if not, I'll figure out why they do. Good, Lee. So why don't you, well, you ask them together, and then Dr. Hoffman will answer them. Go ahead, Lee first. But you don't. I, do, I, I don't follow along. I, don't, I, don't, I understand you don't follow along with it. Yeah. I don't always. Read of course. Not because I don't think the prayers are beautiful, but because something greater. I understand that, fully. That is so special about this temple and about our liturgy, and I would hate to lose it. I hear you. There is something so special, so contemplative, so deeply spiritual. It transcends. <clears throat> Thank you. And I, the prayer book is gorgeous, but my sense of being a Jew comes from the history. It's much older than the prayer book. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, last one. Uh, I think you were more than kind to Isaac and Weiss by not mentioning that he had a very secular commercial interest in prayer books. He was the publisher. Um, he owned what? Okay, thank you. So in fact, the two co those two questions are somewhat related. And of course, that's a question that anyone's on everyone's mind. What prayer book shall we use? Will we continue with the union prayer book? Will our service change? How much will it change? I understand that. And uh, those are all the issues that the rabbi is very deeply engaged in, and that uh, will be the, a matter of discussion as we move forward. So uh, I can't predict, nor do I intend to say that I know what the final decision should be by the congregation. But I can address the two particular concerns. Um, the first concern, uh, actually I'll start with the second one. The second concern has to do with what, why at this point in time there's a question of change in worship style. Uh, and uh, the first comment was, uh, was a, a, an impassioned outcry in favor of what we now have. Um, actually, no, I will begin with the first one, come to think of it. My, I'll change my strategy because, of, because I want to begin with passion. And um, you use certain words that are really quite critical. Uh, um, um, one word was meditative, and the other one was quietude. And I don't remember all of them, but they amounted to this, uh, this impassioned sense of personal and private spirituality that comes with the atmosphere that the Union Prayer Book or the service around the Union Prayer Book provides. So if I may now just separate your comment from the book, I know that's not what you intended, and I don't mean to say that you're, that what you talk, I don't mean to say there's anything wrong with what you said about the book, but I want to just focus for a moment on what really matters to you from what you said. It was not every word in the Union Prayer Book that mattered. It was not page 8 or page 7 or page 25 or anything in particular. What you like most 
is the choreography, if I may use my word, the choreography of service that allows you the sense of awe, the sense of grandeur, the sense of quietude among others, the sense of being able to have a moment of quiet and, and all the other things that you said far more beautifully than I could. I don't think there's any intention to take away the greatness of that ambience of prayer. Let me start there. I think everybody appreciates that. Absolutely. To what extent that goes with the current union prayer book and how it has been used is a good question. There are other ways to get at that kind of ambience, some of which would still use the union prayer book, but differently, and some of which might use the union prayer book updated or changed slightly, and some of which must use, might use the union prayer book and maybe something else. I make no judgment on that. I only want to discriminate between a particular book, which is a symbol of so much, and the muchness, if I can use that word, of which it is a symbol. So the key then is to determine the kind of Jewish identity we have and the experience of Judaism we have coming to prayer and the awesome quietude that you describe so well and to keep that foremost in our thoughts and not to confuse it with a liturgical decision that might be relatively tiny that might not detract from it. Please understand, I make no statement in favor of or opposed to the book. That's not my, my task. And I can see both sides of it, and I think it's not one or the other, to be honest. I think rather, to move to the second question, it's a question of why the issue of change has emerged in our time. The issue of change has emerged in our time and emerged actually back in the 1960s first. And it's continued. The issue of change has emerged because simply put, life has changed. And when life changes, people have a different perception of their self-identity. Jews are different than they were when the Union Prayer Book was composed. It doesn't mean that today's Jews might not find the Union Prayer Book appealing. It might be, however, that Jews might want more than one option, or it might be that Jews would like to see themselves in a service that does more than one thing. I don't know. All of that is something that needs to be studied and thought of somewhat, if possible, dispassionately, with the assumption that whatever happens should not completely do away with all the greatness that the synagogue stands for. One starts with that. This synagogue has a heritage. Let me continue and conclude on this note. The synagogue has a heritage of standing for something transcendent, magnificent, Jewish to its core, and a message that I think, and I told the board and the committee I'm working with, a message that needs to be heard now more than any other time. The voice of Emmanuel is a voice that cannot be stilled. This city of New York needs that voice desperately, and that voice must be heard. Partly that voice is heard here in worship. One large question then is, what is being heard by people who come to worship? What do people think of that voice as it is filtered through the worship service? How can that voice be better, if it can be, be better spread and heard by New Yorkers at large? Is there any modality by which this community can be speaking its age-old message of universalism and hope that I spoke of and so did you, this age-old message, but can we get it out there in a different way, in a better way, in other ways? And how does worship fit into that? Every single synagogue Every single church in America faces that question. Some of them, frankly, it doesn't matter what they do, they've got nothing to say anyway. But when you have a great institution like this, that's had something to say for how many years now, then it matters greatly. I hope you take home from this lecture 
and from this hour together is not a sense of, uh, of um, debate. I hope what you take home then is not a sense that you better take your stand strongly now because by God they're going to change it or take my stand because listen, no one's going to change anything. This is not a debate. I've not come here to take a position. I've come here to celebrate a great prayer book, to explore what prayer means and how prayer books work, to begin the conversation that you mentioned that we might have in studying so we can understand better how to make a wise choice. I've come here with no decision made, but knowing that some change is going to be necessary because the world's changing. This isn't, this isn't you know, surprise to anybody. But the change should not be something foisted on us by the world. The change should be something great that we do from within so we can change the world. And I believe that conversation and that dialogue will take place and that we are now just beginning it, hopefully on the highest possible level, where we can agree that we need learning about it, we need to listen to each other, and we need to recognize that in the long run we all want the same thing. We want this temple to be great. We want its message to go forth. We want its worship to inspire, to uplift, and to inform. And we know that this is a moment when important decisions are made as to how to do that better. As I said before, I have faith in the promise that that will happen. And I thank you then for your attention tonight. Now you have a sense of why I signed up for every single class that he offered when I was at HUC. And I hope you understand what a great privilege it is for me to share my great teacher with my great congregation. Larry, we look forward to taking this journey with you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.